Hello and welcome to the Faith Under Fire podcast, brought to you by Aid to the Church in Need Ireland. I'm your host, Wendy Grace. In this month's episode, I will chat to Gwen Layden, a hugely successful businesswoman who has a vibrant and committed Catholic faith, and she will talk about her life, her faith, and how this intertwines in her business life as well. I will talk to you, Father Nicholas Grace about how to get the balance right when we're trying to witness to our faith, but we're not trying to be too pushy either. Later, I'll go beyond the headlines, bringing you stories of on-the-ground experience of Christian persecution from around the world and stories of hope. But first, I wanted to talk about how we glorify God in our daily lives. I wanted now to talk a little bit about just the courage and the practical ways to gloriously declare God in our everyday lives. The thing that got me thinking about this was recently I watched the Hollywood movie called Fatima. Now, this movie is telling the story of Lucia, Francisco and Jacinta in 1917, who, of course, were blessed with the appearance and presence of the Virgin Mary, where she gave messages to them. And the movie is detailing this story that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Maybe some of you have even visited the pilgrimage site in Fatima. And it also details in the movie the the famous miracle of the sun where it's thought that over 70,000 people saw this miracle of the sun spinning and dancing and appearing to be crashing to the earth and also turning black and this happening on the day that Our Lady promised the children she'd provide a sign to the people that her appearances were authentic so the people would know the children were telling the truth and as the movie details, um, the children were really put under pressure because people didn't believe them. They thought that they were lying, etc. And they really put under pressure um, to say that this wasn't happening. And they were so courageous and they really stood firm in terms of wanting to tell the truth about Our Lady's apparition to them. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, it's a reminder when we hear this story that many of us have heard before many times. Um but we can kind of um, almost forget about them or they just go into the ether a little bit. Watching the movie for me certainly brought it to life. And it's a powerful reminder that throughout the centuries, God has given us so many tangible and powerful signs to prove his existence. Now, of course, we can take encouragement from these miracles, but do we actually use them to to build up and to shore up our faith. And they're the big things, you know, they're the big, incredible miracles that we can hear about or even reading the lives of saints. I find that really encouraging and building up my faith. But do we actually acknowledge God enough each and every day in the little things and the big things? I mean, how often do you acknowledge his works? How often do you answer that call or live up to that challenge to gloriously declare as scripture asks of us, what God has done in your life and for the people around you. When we think of the story of Fatima, Lucia, Jacinta and Francisco, they didn't have any fear of telling people about their experience with Our Lady. Yet I know I myself, and I'm sure many of you listening, can identify with sometimes we lack courage just to simply point out the good God has done in our lives and just bringing God into our everyday conversations and interactions Probably because nowadays it's so countercultural to do so. But one of the first steps, maybe, if we're trying to do this a little bit more in our lives, is to be able to do this, we have to first have awareness. We have to notice what God is doing in the first place. So, first you notice it, and then you kind of take note of it, then share it. When was the last time, even just in a simple way, in an interior way, you did this? I found myself the other day (laughs) when the children were all pushing my buttons and I was feeling quite stressed. And I found myself standing outside and just feeling the warmth of the sun shining on my face, taking a deep breath in appreciation for the warmth of the sun that day that God had given me and thanking God for the grace to give me the patience to parent and mother the children for the rest of the afternoon. I think so often many of us are rushing around or maybe we're just in such a routine. And when I think of our our morning and bedtime routine, you know, when you're trying to get yourself off to work or get the kids to school, you know, it's just bum, 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 one thing after another. That we don't actually stop to appreciate things big and small. Because I was writing this piece, it was really on my heart. And I'll give you an example. I had dropped one child off to school and was on my way to work. 
and realised I'd forgotten something and had to turn back around back to my house and was feeling kind of cross and I was going to be late. And you know what? I was thinking, Wendy, how can I glorify God in this moment? So I pulled into the house and I got what I needed. And then before I got back into the car, instead, you know, instead of rushing and rushing and rushing, I stopped and I took whatever, it was about 30 seconds. And I looked at my house and I said, thank God I have a roof over my head in that moment. And it just changed my whole demeanour, changed the whole humour that I had after being so stressed, rushing around. We need to stop sometimes like that, even if it's just for a short time, to appreciate the things big and small that the Lord is doing in our lives. Secular culture nowadays is totally geared towards constant entertainment, distraction. It can easily lull you into a cycle where you can be kind of sleepwalking through life, missing those moments that are coming from God. We have to see God and the good, or good and the God in others, but also in our environment, in the, in the earth that God has given us. We have to stop putting our heads down in our phones and look up, look up and see what is around us. When you start practising gratitude and you start paying attention, then our glorification of God comes naturally. And practising gratitude also has been proven time and time again in many studies to increase your happiness levels. You know, noticing is one part of the picture, but the other part is a recognition of where the goodness comes from. And again, it's as simple as one person might say, it's a beautiful day. Well, your second sentence is, and thank God for that. But really meaning it, really feeling it, really elevating yourself to God and thanking him for that. It can be as simple as that little prayer, praising God for the meeting that went well or the meeting that didn't go well, but that God gave you the strength to get through. Or the grace you were given to be patient with somebody who was getting on your nerves. I think one of the things in terms of glorifying God and and others recognising that is bringing back those simple traditions that have been eradicated over time. For example, here in Ireland, we used to always say, God bless you. Or the beautiful Irish phrase, our beautiful language, diagwitch, how we say hello in Irish, means God be with you. And the response would always be, Dia Agus Muragwich, meaning God and Mary be with you. What a beautiful blessing to give to somebody. Now to say it is one thing, you know, habitually, God bless, is one thing. But to say it and to mean it is powerful. Hearing someone calling God's blessing on you, it's, as I said, it's now becoming less common. But I find because it's less common, when I give it, when I mean it, when I look the person in the eye... The vast majority of the time, you get a receptive and pleasantly surprised smile. I think that sometimes we think we're pushing our faith on people. But authentically living your faith and showing these little acts isn't pushing anything on anyone. It's just being yourself. The fact that, for example, seeing someone say grace before meals in a restaurant is now more unusual than usual can actually make it all the more impactful. Have courage and never be afraid to be proud of the role that faith plays in your life. So, for example, the next time someone asks you, as often happens, what are you up to this weekend? Sometimes you might leave out rather than in the fact that you will attend Mass. But tell people, yeah, I'm going to take the kids to the park and we have a birthday party and of course Sunday Mass, best part of my weekend. As always when it comes to these things, Scripture has the key in helping us to show glory to God. As Matthew 5 says, Like a city built on a hill or a lamp set on a lampstand, glorifying God entails letting the light of the attributes of God shine before men so that others will join us in glorifying our Father in heaven. In other words, when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Our faith gives us the true joy that is needed to be thankful for and to witness to God's glory each and every day. And that light that scripture is talking about will be obvious. So I hope that this reflection has helped you think about the ways that you can show gratitude for and glorify God each and every day in your life. 
So now it's time for this month's profile interview and this month's guest is businesswoman Gwen Layden. And in this interview, Gwen is going to talk about her life and her faith and how faith is intertwined in it all and especially in her business life because Gwen is the executive director of the Layden Group and one of their primary tasks is managing and looking after the tenants in the historic Georgia Street Arcade. She was also recently runner-up in the Diversity and Inclusion Businesswoman of the Year category at the PW you see Image Businesswoman of the Year Award. So I think it's just really inspiring and interesting to see a businesswoman out there in the business world. And you'll know when you hear our conversation that she never shies away from sharing her faith with others. She's very open about it. She's very vibrant in sharing her faith in her everyday life. She's also married and she's a mum to four children and we'll be talking about that as well. So I started off just by talking to Gwen just about her faith growing up. Well, faith, um, I suppose I didn't see it, but we would have been um, probably considered a, quite a faithful family back for generations, you know. But it was something that the, what we weren't um, presented with it in any very pushy way. And uh, But I suppose a dad went to Loch Derg, granddad went to Loch Derg, um, I had, um I went with him, obviously, and it was a great place to learn how to pray. Um, I suppose watching people praying is very effective. You know, it's the little things. I had an Aunt Mary, and she, when I get into her car, she always had rosary beads. And I loved her, and I loved her rosary beads. And then it was just seeing your parents' blessings as passing a church. That was another one. And um, so it was the little things. I think that's and really important, Gwen, for people listening, that really, yeah. sometimes we forget the impact that sowing those little seeds can have. As you say, sure. seeing the rosary beads, or, you know, my toddler this morning, she's only two, and her job was to take the holy water and give everyone their blessings, and she gets very excited about it. And these are the oh, things, goodness. I suppose we can't underestimate no. how the little things can make a big difference later on oh, in life. Oh my goodness, that's gorgeous, Wendy. That's so sweet. That is exactly it. And... Um, you know, so yes, I mean, I'm sure my aunt, when she came to her, didn't realise, but I loved her, the fact of the rosy beads. Then we had a missionary aunt, um, who was, and it wasn't because she was an, a nun, she was a married sister, it was because she was joyful. So I suppose the thing that I am so aware of, thank God I've got joy in my heart, is that when you're trying to give faith, if it's accompanied with joy, it's a lot easier, you know. So if you see somebody joyful who's deeply holy, and living a good life, a missionary life, that has a big impact too. Yeah, the, the word joy is a really powerful one, isn't it? And I think, yeah. as you say, it's, it's interesting that you kind of focus on that because, and that experience that you had with your aunt, who's mm-hmm. the missionary, that you mm-hmm. kind of, whatever she, that joy she had, you thought, oh, I want to, you know, yeah. whatever she, whatever's given her that joy, I want part of that. So I yeah. think it's an important reminder. Sometimes we can, do you think, maybe get a little bit, um, feel the weight of the world on our shoulders and that sucks the joy mm-hmm. out of our faith. Yes. Yes. Well, of course, faith is a great giver of joy, in my view, you know. Um, so, uh, yes, I agree. Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to just fast forward a little bit to now is um, mm-hmm. come on into adulthood then and college and work life and everything. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and your faith journey through all of that, Gwen. Well, I suppose I was in UCD and I mean, I know that it's desperate to see how faith is not present uh, in colleges, they tell us. But then there's a focus group there at the moment, so there are great uh, green shoots, you know. Um, when I was in college, there was a church in the middle of the campus in UCD. Not many people visited now. But I would have always gone to Mass for Lent. And it was funny the few people you'd see at Mass. But there wouldn't be that many. But um, faith continued to be part of uh, my journey, probably a more quiet way, because um, it was your studies and, um, you know, the arts balls and that. And religion wasn't as present as it would have been at school, where we prayed every morning. But um, it stays in your heart, and it wasn't persecuted. That's something I definitely say in our day. That was in the early 90s. Do you think that's something that's changed? I don't know. But, I mean, I know that, um, you know, Casey Asko would have would have experienced that persecution when she was in college. Yeah, she was Never elected the SU that. president, wasn't she, a yeah. number of years ago, and then ultimately yeah. had to step down when they... when. She was kind of rounded upon when it was realised that she had faith, she was pro-life, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, certainly when we were there, I mean, I always say to my sister, we were the true liberals. Like, we really criticised nobody. You know, we didn't have any very rigid ideas of what anybody should be. Um, So I think it was a nice time. And of course, then when the Pope came to Ireland, everybody went 
um, no family didn't go. It was back in the 70s, you know. So, yeah, I suppose the Ireland at that time, there was definitely uh, a friendly attitude towards faith. It was respected. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your marriage and that. Where did you meet your husband? Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose giving faith um, to your family, you don't realise, I suppose, underneath it all, you definitely, when you uh, fall in love, uh, I remember just before getting married, I used to keep waking up with the same the same dream that I was walking up the aisle and there was somebody completely unsuitable and there was somebody with faith. And I went with the one with faith. <laughs> so deep down, it must have been a big, a big important thing. But I met my husband in Glenstone Abbey. And um, so we were very lucky in that um, we didn't meet because of faith. We met because I really liked him. And I liked, in fact, it was his sister uh, who I really liked. Uh, just she was something about her. She had a great joy and a great love in her. And she was talking to her father about meeting him at the Mallow Races at the end of the retreat. And I remember thinking, she's a very nice girl. It was whatever way she spoke to her dad. And maybe uh, that just spoke to me uh, of a, something that felt right. Probably the way I spoke to my own parents. And there was a warmth between them. So her and her, her she, my husband was there with his sister and some friends. So we met at a retreat in Glenstone Abbey. Mm-hmm. What a beautiful start to Well, we marriage. were just friends now. You know, we met as friends, you know. So it developed. But he brought me to the King and I in London and booked two rooms in the hotel. It was a work, <laughs> a work gig. So um, that was the first date. So it was very special. That's it. Yeah, pretty, know. pretty. That was setting this bar high, wasn't it, Gwen? <laughs> Well, you know, I, we went as friends to the the concert, so if it hadn't worked out, and I hadn't dated much, and obviously every little girl wants to marry, and my father keeps saying, there's a lovely man around the corner, and he doesn't know how lucky he is. <laughs> but, you know, your father would say that. So I was, you know, I would have been cautious in the dating thing. So it was, yeah, it was very lucky, and God brought us together, thank God. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how long you're married now, and, you're, and how many children you have, and the ages they are. So we have four children, and they are it steps of stairs now. There's one boy studying for his leaving, as we speak, and one boy's finished first year in college, one boy's in TY, and one girl is in uh, going into third year. So they're 14, kind of 16, 18, and 19. Yeah. Uh, and Gwen, how have you tried to keep faith in your family, uh, especially, you know, throughout the years with your children? Yeah. And they're, now they're, most of them are young adults where I imagine there's different challenges. Yeah, well, you know what? It was very natural and very easy really at the start because for the first probably 13 years, every summer, every morning, I walked them all to Mass. So we live in near Boostown Parish and it was quite a walk. It was probably a 30 minute walk and up out the door for 10 o'clock Mass. So we'd be leaving us about at the latest 25 to 10. Then we'd have to run past it. So we always made, that was the routine for just the, all the summers for probably at least 13, 14 years. So that's, they were just going to daily mass naturally and it was part of our routine and we walked and we chatted and we sat down and we had a cup of milk or a biscuit after um, in Cleason's across the road and I had my coffee and we'd walk back. So that, without me knowing, probably set, um, put quite a bit of faith in them. But that alone wouldn't be, or you that wouldn't work really. I think the most important thing is for them to have a joy of faith so that it's a presented as, I wasn't brought to mass every morning. And I have a deep faith, so that's not necessary. I think that um, probably, I think some children click in, but I sent them to schools that were Catholic. And I would have always been involved in the Catholic parts of the schools, helping the chaplain in Blackwood College, who's a wonderful man, and likewise the nuns in Mount Amber and the Sixth Associates. So the schools helped, but there again, lots of children had it in the schools and they don't have faith. So what makes a teenager, gives a teenage faith, Thank goodness they have faith. And I think um, it's just... Uh, it's probably a, your witness by the sounds of Gwen, yeah, and the joy that you have and the yeah. witness of your marriage and, and, and uh, I mean, your business life as well, you know, that your faith has integrated into every part of your life. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that next. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about your business and your work. You're a very accomplished businesswoman, an award-winning businesswoman. Tell us about that. Well, now I didn't set out to win awards, but uh, it, they've been, it's been um, they're gratefully received. Um, but um, you know, I'm not I'm not a great business. I mean, I just to be honest with you, I lived my business um, is very much would be uh, instructed by my faith. So I went. I started working with my father, and um, it, we wouldn't be saying prayers in work or any of that. But the way he did his work was charitable. 
um, he had one arm of the business that was always charity related. <clears throat> so he, um, well, for example, he built schools and wells in, in Niger in Western Africa. So he Googled what's the poorest place on earth and he went out there and he joined up with Concern and uh, the Central Bank, or they were a bank, and they built schools and drilled wells. So he was always actively uh, looking after other people. And I suppose where I, it started to notice it was I, got, I used to help him answer the phones when he started out back in the early 80s in his uh, office and outside the office was a man called Robert. And Robert got a pay packet every week. So he didn't get just given money, but he got a pay packet. And he was homeless. And that gave him dignity. So it just, that instructed how our business life was to work. So we definitely weren't doing roses or same prayers, but Dad's faith would be a living faith. And uh, so that certainly instructed, uh, that showed me how to do business, but to be compassionate. So I think the awards that I've won are more about compassion than being a dynamic businesswoman. <laughs> so, um, I've, um, and then I go to Mass every morning, and certainly that instructs your day. If ever you have a question mark about what to do in any business situation, uh, the readings and the gospel would be my roadmap. Yeah, so you start your day with Mass and that just that sets the tone for you, does it? Yeah, it does, yeah. I get, I'm get i very lucky. Sometimes I get Mass, um, I get the kids out to school and um, I cycle over to Mass sometimes in the school at age 15, in Blackwell College, and then I bring my mum to Mass with me at 10 o'clock. So, and I go into the office. Two masses. That. So, <laughs> by, by 10.30, I've popped into the office and I've possibly had two masses. And then you're back by 10.45 and you're still motoring to the long day. And what a, a privilege. I'm so lucky, you know. Um, mass is just a, a total gift. I absolutely love mass. And I tell us a little bit about your work. So you are basically overseeing the Georgia Street Arcade, the iconic Georgia Street Arcade, which is in Dublin. And for people who don't know it or people listening from other countries, tell us a little bit about it and just the day-to-day the, the day -day work and interactions that you have to have, Gwen. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, about uh, in the early 90s, Dad bought a rundown building. And, it, I mean, he had to borrow and everything to buy it, obviously. And he just thought it had potential. And he asked me, would I look after it? Now, at the time, there were very few people in it, and it was pretty run down. So I sold off bits and pieces to bring it back to its original state, which is 1881 was the day it opened. And George Street Arcade is now the exact same as it was on the day it opened, 1881. The same gates, the same wrought iron, the floor tiling, everything. So uh, that was the first job. And then I just wanted to fill it with people and allow everyone to enjoy it. So it wasn't much to enjoy at the time because it wasn't a great area. But luckily, the area has come up, and I've got 42 independent businesses there. And every day I meet a new person. A man from Turkey now um, who um, has just opened up, and he has a wall. So even if I have no stores or shops, I just give walls to people. Now, I give them for free to start, and I particularly make a space for people who are new to the country. And I particularly make a space for people, young Irish designers who are trying to start out. So I have one such a girl, and her name is Megan McGuigan, seeking Judy. And she went for a wall. She was just at college. And I said, put your stuff there and see if people like it. And the public have loved it. And she's now right at the top of the arcade. And she's got these extraordinary bags. She's selling all around her. And she really has her own her own business. And it's all her own designs. And she's only out of college a year and a half. So the, it's very human uh, stories. Every one of them. I know every one of them. I know all their families and all belonging to them. Uh, some have suffered different crises. And we bear with them. And COVID was just one crisis, and that was we got publicity for that, um, for giving free rents during COVID. But really, there's a COVID in somebody's life every day, you know, and uh, it's about knowing that that person is going through that and just saying, look, take a break, um, you know, and uh, looking out for them, helping them with documentation, helping them with different things. So it's... Um, there they are. So they're all in there now. and they're. I imagine, Gwen, that what could happen is, and probably what does happen is, you probably have a reputation in Dublin for being the kind and generous um, businesswoman that you are and kind of allowing people to have space in Georgia Street Arcade to, to try out their wares and to see if they can make a living. So is your door not beaten down? How do you manage that? Yes, well, you know, yeah, that's true. I mean, I would be known to give starts. So I do get phone calls and I do get emails. But I reply to everyone on the day that I get it. So it doesn't get on top of me. And then 12 o'clock on Thursday, I'm down there. And if there's been somebody that week that's been asking me, I'd always meet them and have a chat with them. And, you know, a poet um, contacted me recently. He said he was a playwright. So I let him put his verses up on the wall. So you can always help somebody, you know. And um, 
once you're on the ground and it's about having an open mind really and being relaxed about it and um, generally speaking if you look somebody in the eye and you trust them they will return that trust and you don't have um, you know you don't have any problems uh, certainly touch wood not to date and um, then you have to be careful when the Ukrainian war broke out we wanted to be the US and I said I wanted it just for Ukrainians but you couldn't put that up and we've made place for Africans for everybody but uh, so at uh, that time I did have a lot of replies we uh, put it up on our company thing but you know you get to meet a lot of people and out of giving time to people you know it's a two way street you know even if you don't have a unit for everybody you can often guide them or direct them or have a chat with them and it's nice for people to know that there is a possibility there is an opportunity so I'd never write back and say I don't have anything I'd normally say listen I don't have anything now but if you'd like to meet me so yeah it works out but you do get lots of inquiries but there's they're they're enlightening they're people with ideas and everybody's idea is a good idea you know it's not for any of us to judge it and if they think it's a good idea normally it's a good idea it's lovely to hear them speak it's such a lovely generous uh, but also a lovely humble attitude with all of that then, Gwen, you're meeting different people from all over the world, people of all faiths and none and different mm-hmm. experiences and, and war-torn countries, as you've mentioned, I'm sure countries where Christians are persecuted as well. How does your faith kind of weave into that day and, and your decision-making and, and your business and your interactions with people? Because I think that's something that many people who are listening struggle with To mm-hmm. As you use that phrase, you know, a living faith and think, gosh, you know, how do I bring this into work? How do I bring this into my business? every day and and i think for some of us it's hard to find the courage sometimes to do that in the everyday even normal ways Mm -hmm. i know what you're saying i'll go back to it yeah i I agree well in terms of the arcade i mean for example a man came in recently with a kind of a turban on his head and he was looking for you and the first thing i said is like gosh that's a fabulous head what piece and he said well i'm a sikh indian you know and he proceeded to ask that's wonderful and I said, to, and um, he was telling me about how they pray, etc. You know, it wasn't unlike the rosary, you know. And but I would always, um, you know, it's simple things. I suppose if you're wearing a cross, somebody probably knows that you have faith, and that's not a bad idea, you know, because then immediately somebody's relaxed about their own faith. So um, I and then I would always speak to the tenants about, you know, they're keeping the Ramadan, and I like congratulate them, I admire them, you know. So we have so many religions in there. But I have huge admiration for all of them. So nobody feels they have to hide their religion, you know. And uh, it's not, I mean, whatever God anybody is, is praying to, it's good to pray. And um, well, How do you, you know, share yours just in your working day, Gwen? Just um, yeah, like you say, I wearing your cross or it's, is it just yeah. in your, the decisions you make? Or I don't actually kind of have to really. I just, um, my working life hopefully would reflect what the gospel might say we should do, but not always, my goodness. But I would aim for that. And um but I don't um I don't have to bring it into work other than in, in the way you just act or are. I mean the only time I ever really had to speak out was I remember uh at the referendum and Bishop Doran was criticized after the Eighth Amendment and uh was repealed. And Bishop Doran said that people who had Catholics who voted uh for the repeating of the eighth, should go to confession. And I remember RTE all during the referendum. I was ringing RTE saying, "Please, can I come on and speak? Please, can I come on and speak?" You know, and <laughs> they didn't want me. And then it was just the day that it had been lost, and nobody obviously wanted to go on the television that night. And they eventually rang me and said, um, "Now will you go on?" <laughs> and I remember my husband and my father going, "Don't, Gwen. This is just not the night to go on." You know the. The, the referendum has been won by the other side and you'll only just be, you know, laughed at or whatever. But I went into the studio because it was my first chance and I was delighted that I would have got. And I had no qualms at all and Claire Byrne, it was Claire Byrne, and she came over to me and she said, Gwen, the whole room was full with colours and everybody was, you know, delighted and they were all, uh, had won, the, uh, they had won their votes. They were mostly people who had won the repeal, they were on the repeal side. And um, so then they said, she, Claire, and she came down to me and she said, um, so, Gwen, how must you feel tonight, you know? <laughs> and you must feel awful. And I said, look, I appreciate that there was a, a democracy. I think it's good there's a democracy. So she, they weren't expecting that. And then I proceeded to defend confession, that uh, as Catholics we have confession, and that I think it's a very good thing that you should check your conscience and, you know, think about it, and that that's surely a good thing. And, you know, afterwards, Mary Lou MacDonald came over to me and said, 
you know, you represent yourself very well. So I think that we should, we shouldn't be shy about speaking about our faith. There's nothing bad in it at all. And if you speak without criticizing the other person, um, just stay with the positives of, generally speaking, I think that we have, we should have much to talk about. Yeah, and as you say, sticking with the positive cell, you you have a lot of courage and I'm sure you've given people a lot of encouragement. I want to just ask you that final question, Gwen, you know, because again, just just for our listeners, it's probably been just a joy to hear about your life and your business and your family and how faith has been interwoven through all of that. Um, But for some listening, they might think, gosh, you know, my experience is very different or different Mm -hmm. struggles or whatever the case may be. And I think some people feel a little bit of hopelessness about the future for faith in Ireland even though obviously hope is at the core of our faith we have to remember mm-hmm. that but how do you feel about the future of the Catholic faith in Ireland and, and the role that we all have to play in it? Yes well you know I'm involved in the synodal process over in Town Parish in our parish and I also see where the hopelessness could could um, surface you know when you see the lack of attendance at mass etc. The only thing I'd say is that I think Catholic schools are a really fertile ground that I think that we need to look at because the parents that have sent their children there have a wish for them to be brought up Catholic. They've been baptised. So I'm a sacred associate, and about five years ago I started navigating my way into the school. It wasn't easy, but um, the nuns would have run our school years ago, and I felt that was where my place was, to bring it to the children in school. Every one of them, when I go into an assembly now, and the principal has been so generous in allowing me to go into the assembly with the junior school girls. There'll be 300 girls, and every one of them have beautiful hearts, filled with love. That's where the faith is. I think that there's such love in every single heart in the world. And if everyone is told that just by having a loving heart, they are a person of great faith, and start from there. And I suppose then just, you know, find, bring people together to pray, even if it's not, if it's, if we could start it at meetings, if we could start it in schools, obviously, um, to join in prayer is a lovely thing to do, even if it's just a Hail Mary. Um, that most people have it in their hearts and they don't have a great objection to it, really. Not the objection that we think. Now, the people who object to it are very loud and they're very vocal and they're often get onto the airwaves. But most people I know have hearts full of love and they want to have a God that they can pray to. So Yeah, it's I, I think your your experience has probably been echoed certainly in a few conversations I've had where there's much more openness yeah. than we imagine from the majority and it can be the loud minority that can put yeah. us off having the courage to share our faith. I totally agree with that. Totally agree. Well, with well, that. It's been and a people pleasure. are offended when they hear that, you know, when they fear the religion, but they don't have the courage to come back or they don't get the media um space to do it. But, um, yeah, I agree. I agree. Most of us do love love God, love nature, the gift of God gave us, and have love in our hearts. And that's what it's about. Well, to say the, the best starting point, well, Gwen, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Faith Under Fire podcast. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Now it's time to go beyond the headlines. So this is the part of the podcast where I bring you stories of Christian persecution and indeed hope from around the world that are often not reported or underreported in the mainstream media. So I wanted to turn now to certainly a country that we rarely hear about the issues happening in terms of persecuted Christians. Um, And there's ongoing violence, especially in India's Manipur state. Now, apparently this is part of a larger plan to destabilise interreligious harmony and raise support for the ruling Hindutva Nationalist Party. This is according to local church sources that ACN has been in touch with. Um, One of the things that they're saying is that extremists want to terrorise Christians and Muslims to try and win over Hindus, that is their that that is their kind of tactic. Um, the party is called the Bateria Janta Party or BJP, and there's going to be general elections next April. So that is why this is all kind of heating up. This is what a bishop from the region told Aid to the Church in Need. And this, I suppose, gives you an insight in terms of just the level of hostility there. This particular bishop 
asked not to be named because of needing to be safe and secure. But he has been in direct contact with Christians in and around Impal. Now, that's the capital of Manipur, which is in the northeastern part of India. Now, this conflict has been raging for some weeks now. And the bishop said that many lives had been lost. And he said what the newspapers are giving are confirmed cases, but there's many more lives lost than that have actually been officially published. He said that the violent activities outside the capital are totally underreported. Now, a report that was sent to ACN by the Infal Diocese claims that more than 50,000 people have been displaced since violence erupted. And the bishop went on to say that the real reason for the problem is the size of the Christian population. Now, the ethnic groups in this area, the Kugis and the Nagas, they together occupy this a big portion of the state lands. Um, but what the Hindus feel is that they should be allowed to go and occupy land owned by the tribals. And he said that's a part of the problem here. So... The BJP, just to explain it to you, they actually run both the federal government and Manipur. So there is kind of this tacit permission to go ahead. Now, it's widely reported that the violence is caused by an ethnic dispute over land ownership. The bishop said that religion does play a significant role. He said that there's Christians among the Metis. This is another um this is a, a, another kind of tribal group in the area and that many of their churches have been destroyed. And he said, look, this is clear proof that this isn't just about land. And sadly, he said the end is nowhere in sight, that there has been mistrust created between the two groups and that it's not easily going to die out. Now, according to, to local reports which were obtained by ACN, 249 Matai Christian churches have been destroyed since the beginning of the conflict and extremists have attacked more than 200 kooky villages and ravaged countless homes. Now this report was put together by the Imphal Diocese and it also questions the role played by state security forces. The bishop said it's hard to say if the state forces were outnumbered or overwhelmed with calls for help or if they were complicit. That's kind of the question that's being asked. He said that the absence of security personnel in places where they're most needed also raises questions and and said, you know, why is it that vulnerable places were left unguarded even after there was attempted attacks? Um, He urged against a generalisation, of course, of Hindus stressing the vast majority do not agree with what is happening, but they are afraid to say it because it's going to get them into trouble. So we have to join in prayer with India. And remember, when you support the work of aid to the church in need, they are able to connect that practical support with what's needed on the ground in these countries. I wanted to bring you another story now, closer to home, which is just really uh, asking for a call for justice at number 10 Downing Street um, because it's just over a year since the Pentecost Sunday Church Massacre happened in Nigeria and a petition calling for justice was handed in recently at 10 Downing Street. MP Fiona Bruce and she's also the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. She received the petition and this was organised by Aid to the Church in Need and on the 5th of June uh, we have to remember what happened on the 5th of June 2022 uh, just to remind you absolute tragedy and just the massacre of 41 people 41 people were killed and more than 80 were injured when terrorists opened fire and detonated explosives during Holy Mass at St. Francis Saviour's Church in Owo in South West Nigeria now nobody has been charged in connection with the atrocity and it took place in, in broad daylight in a church packed with witnesses and of course families and young children. Now human rights champions and Nigeria experts Baroness Caroline Cox and Lord David Alton uh, earlier on in June came together with Aid to the Church in Need um, and they handed in this particular petition and Lord Alton said that he was shocked to hear about the cruel and barbaric attacks and he said things only get worse when the perpetrators are not brought to justice. Um, Also, one of the things that happened recently was that a Father Madeira talked to Aid to the Church in Need and he said, look, I think something positive will come out of the petition. It's important to raise awareness. The more awareness we can generate, the more likely the outcome is. He also said that that they were hopeful that a new president of Nigeria, the new president, Abola Tinubu, who was sworn in only recently, it was the 29th of May, he hoped and prayed would do more 
work to serve justice and s- provide more security. Now, survivors of the OO attack speaking to aid to the church in need said that they continue to feel unsafe until those responsible are brought to justice. Father Michael Abugan, who's the parish priest at St. Francis Xavier, said that his congregation remembered the victims at a candlelight procession and his memori- and memorial mass on the anniversary. He said on behalf of the survivors, I'm hoping that the new government will be entirely different from the past in response to these matters. He said, we also believe the new president will do his best to bring different ethnic groups and religions together. That is something certainly we have to hope and pray for, that there will be the political will in Nigeria to tackle the persecution that is happening there. I wanted to bring you now a good news story and it's one that owes thanks I'm sure to many of you listening for the financial support that you have provided to aid the church in need. And just looking at one country um, in terms of what is happening in Ukraine, aid to the church in need was able to provide 9.5 million euros of aid last year and that's about 10% of, of the overall aid of ACN. And just to let you know that that supported 353 vital projects so this is really practical stuff like support for those who are internationally displaced, um, practical you know, both temporal and spiritual needs and I think that's the key thing here when it comes to the work of Age of the Church in Need that it's looking at both, it's the holistic it's the practical and the spiritual uh, Bishop Hovera of Lutusk, which is in northwest Ukraine said, we sincerely thank Aid to the Church in Need because of the gesture of sacrifice, solidarity and support we are praying for you and may God bless you. So it provided direct emergency aid for more than 2,200 internally displaced people and this all this is it's another reminder and it's something that again it's just not talked about in the media enough it's just the heroic work that lay people of faith and church institutions are doing because most of this aid was distributed via church institutions all of this essential equipment things like portable ovens for example for 231 parishes for monasteries for seminaries so they could keep going And for those especially who were in all of these locations caring for displaced people and displaced families, um, there's also been subsistence for 7,447 priests and sisters who are doing such important work, who have not left, who are both providing material and most importantly, spiritual report. For example, just to give you one example, the contemplative Benedictines in Solonka, this is in western Ukraine, they suspended their cloistered way of life to open their doors to families fleeing the fighting. Now, they've welcomed more than 500 people since the conflict began and aid the church in need also. Just practical stuff provided vehicles so the church could actually bring relief to places that are really difficult to access as well, of course, provide that all important pastoral support. So I just wanted to give a huge amount of thanks to those who are giving and continue to provide that support and just remember the the huge impact that is making us and and just focusing on Ukraine today and if you want to find out more details about how you can support the work of aid to the church in need you can go to acnireland.org So earlier on in the podcast, I was talking a little bit about how it's important to glorify God in our everyday lives, just to open our eyes to seeing what God is doing in your day, what God is doing in your life and trying to weave that into your day. So that's great on the one hand, but on the other hand, can we get the balance wrong? Can we go overboard? Can we go over the top? And then you might be saying, okay, Wendy, I'm confused. You're telling me we got to share our faith, we got to glorify God, but don't share it too much. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's tricky getting the balance right on this one. But joined with me now to help us through this for this reflection, I have Father Nicholas Grace. Let's start with that, Father Nicholas. How do you get the balance right? Well, Wendy, there is a good bit of advice from the spiritual masters that says, admire the saints in everything. But in everything, do not imitate them. Okay, break that one down for us then. Well, God, uh, there's two words I'd like you to to have present in what I'm going to talk about today. Discretion and indiscretion. But we'll get to that. God calls each one to a certain height of holiness and no higher. And although we can never know to what height we shall reach before we die, we are given a, a amount of grace by God measured to us 
for every step of the way. And so we shouldn't act beyond the, the grace that he has given us. Am I going over your head a bit there? Yeah, you might need to break that down into lay women speak for me. Um, so, like, God gives us petrol for the journey. But if we try to go further than the petrol will last, the car is going to break down. And some people, they try to do too much um, and they don't have the sufficient help from God to do it. Um, besides, also, um, we have to bear in mind our weakness, our cowardice, and even this thing that I mentioned before, our indiscreet zeal. Uh, I think, yeah, probably, Nicholas, that's something that can be kind of common, especially when people, oh, obviously this isn't true for everybody and it depends on the individual's experience, but when somebody has, let's say, a big conversion moment or a big conversion kind of experience and then they're kind of on fire and they're just kind of sharing with everybody and, you know, they're, they're full of so much joy, so much energy, but it's not meeting people where they're at because it kind of overwhelms people and can do the opposite of what the person is trying to do and yeah. turn the person off. Yeah, yeah. Even myself, when, when I was converting, I used to lecture my poor brother on morality constantly. I'd read a text of St. Paul, and immediately I'd apply it to him and lecture him, and it did far more harm than good. And that is like, um, that's like one of the most common faults of people who are just converting and they're on fire. Um, discretion, on the other hand, is something very much subject to God's grace, like the Holy Spirit moves a person in a discreet manner. By, by discretion, I mean the quality of behaving in a quiet, unassuming and controlled way without drawing unnecessary attention to ourselves. It's quite the opposite of ostentation. Discretion. I think it probably depends as well, doesn't it, on the individual person, their personality, the gifts that God has given them. Um, in other words, there isn't kind of a set formula for this. Some people, it is maybe their gift to be able to speak up, especially maybe on particular hot topic issues or, you know, challenging teachings from the Catholic Church that are certainly challenging from a worldly perspective. So do we have to kind of, cut, you know, be, be, be prudent and not just as a general rule, but also in the moment as well? Yeah, hold it there, though, as well. Remember what I said. Discretion is something very much subject to God's grace, the Holy Spirit, the grace of God. So if a person has a very outgoing uh, personality and they can speak to anyone, anytime, any place, that's them. The grace of God, sometimes, if they're moved by God's grace, that kind of part of their personality might be tempered because it mightn't be the right time to be, to be saying a thousand words. Do you follow me? There, there's, there's the difference. One person is acting on their own behalf and the other is being moved by God. Yeah, um, I can't help but think, obviously you're using the word grace there a good bit. Is yeah. there another part to this in terms of the discretion rule? Like, let's say, for example, somebody listening knows they're going to be going into the lion's den. They know they're going out for dinner with, say, a, a drink or whatever with a group of friends. They know X, Y, or Z is going to come up. Um... But they don't prepare themselves with the spiritual needs. Obviously, there's a practical, okay, knowing how to talk about what they think might come up. But then if they don't have the grace, as you say, if they haven't done the spiritual, if they haven't had that time with the Lord, say, that week, they don't have the grace for that conversation. So is it in those moments where you go, you know what, I haven't built, I haven't, I'm not getting the grace for this right now, so I'm going to keep it zipped. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's right. It, you wouldn't say that to the people. That would be indiscreet. I haven't been praying this week, so I'm not going to answer your questions. That would be ostentatious and indiscreet. Look, this, this evangelization, moved by the grace of God in a discreet way, it's a way of relating to people that is delicate when necessary. It's capable of giving the least amount of offense. We're not trying to offend people. It's... it's Discreet people aren't showy or flash, and they can be trusted with secrets. So uh, it's a whole... Some people, because they're naturally outgoing and they speak a lot, they need to be molded by God's grace so that they can behave in this way when they evangelize. Does that make sense? Yeah, depending on, on, on your personality. So 
you'll know the scripture better than me, but the one that it warns us of the power of the tongue, you know, some people that are so verbose and, and maybe can build people over with their confidence in their speaking, but that doesn't mean that they're actually, you know, winning hearts or, you know, even helping people to begin or renew a relationship with God. So there's that on the one hand, but what about, yeah. you know, the other side that people might be listening going, well, you know, what if my subconscious or conscious uses this as kind of an excuse to to hide my faith and, and you know, to be a bit cowardly sometimes, you know, earlier on I was talking about just the little signs, you know, blessing yourself in a restaurant or whatever, but that you could use this to go, oh no, I don't want to be uh, going over the top today on this one. Yeah. yeah well, that's going to happen a lot, all right. So a person has to be honest with themselves and with the Lord. And a person will know whether they are being truthful or not if they pray. So every serious Christian, every serious Catholic, every serious believer really uh, should have set time to pray to the Lord every day or at least every week. And that's how you avoid those problems. If you want, though, because, again, I'm more interested on the other side of the coin today, Wendy, like, because often it does more harm than good. I thought I could give you a few examples about how people can go over the top. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, like, I'd say a person can be over the top or indiscreet, particularly in the early stages, early stages of their religious practice, by the sacrifices that they make for the Lord or the penance that they do or the prayers even that they say. Prayers and devotions like like the rosary, novenas, divine mercy. I mean, I pray all these every day myself, but sometimes religious people can be rushing from one prayer to the other, having to finish this novena or that rosary. And this can be an annoyance and a discomfort to those around them perhaps those who are seeking their attention, that they won't give because they did that with the other prayer to say. In penance, like doing penance, this we've done this in the church since the beginning of the church, this can be exaggerated and cause scandal to those who don't understand it. When I was converting, I read the life of St. Dominic, and the author was saying that Dominic used to wear chains on his legs. I didn't know what these chains were, so I started putting elastic bands on my legs. And my mother was horrified. <laughs> she, she thought I'd lost the plot altogether. She was thinking, what kind of religion is this? So that was totally over the top. Um, I finally did get the chains, but uh, they're not elastic bands. Also, penance is like fasting. In the church, people would fast on a Friday, do fast on a Friday. There's an important rule to observe. If fasting gives us bad humor or makes us short and snappish. Discretion would have us lose our penance rather than lose our patience. What do you think the Lord was talking about, our blessed Lord, when he said, anoint your head with oil while fasting so that people would think you had eaten and your fasting would remain secret. Instead, the hypocrites there in Israel were walking around uh, with grumpy faces on them because they wanted people to know they were fasting. Do you see? Do you see the sense in that, Wendy? Yeah, no, I, I, and I think that a lot of people probably identify with some of the things that you're saying. But I wanted to finish with just your final thoughts on people that are kind of absorbing the advice here, but saying, "Look, I want to grow. I want to grow in holiness. How do I do this? Sharing my faith, but also getting the the balance right, making sure that I ha- I'm able to practice that that discretion. But how do I live it out in everyday life? Yeah, well. I'll give you three things. One, which sounds easy, but it's actually really hard. You want to be devout. You want to love the Lord. Never say no to charity. No matter what prayers you're doing or no matter what things you're doing for the Lord, if someone asks your help, never say no. No matter what you plan yourself, in that person the Lord is asking you. That's advice of St. Teresa of Avila. Also, St. Francis de Sales says, when we're speaking on religious topics, always remember, he says, when you speak of God, that he is God. And speak reverently and with devotion, but not affectedly or as if you were preaching, but preach with a spirit 
of meekness, speak with a spirit of love and humility. And finally, a person wants to love the Lord, serve the Lord, be, dev- be, be, be devout and to grow in the zealousness of their conversion. Very simple answer, and this is the last thing I'll tell you today. Get a spiritual director, a guide, somebody who can instruct you, somebody who you can run by things. You know, should I do this devotion? Should I practice that? Is it good to, to speak? Like you mentioned before, what do I do? Um, every Wednesday I'm meeting the girls for a coffee and these topics come up. Get a spiritual director so you can get advice. Yeah, well, you've given us good advice today and certainly um, I think helps a lot of people to navigate what can, what can be a really, really tricky part of our faith journey. Father Nicholas Ray, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. God bless you all. And thank you for joining us on this month's Faith Under Fire podcast. I've been your host, Wendy Grace, and this podcast was brought to you by A to the Church in Need, Ireland. If you want to connect up with the work of ACN Ireland and support the incredible work they do, countries around the world where Christians are persecuted, you can go to their website which is acnireland.org. Please do subscribe on your preferred platform and as always I'd be grateful if you can share with family and friends. I will talk to you next month. In the meantime, God bless you all.